this week has just been one of them weeks where I feel like I haven't had a minute. I need to look at the camera, I keep looking at the screen, look at the camera. Um, but I finally had a chance to film some stuff and we're doing something quite different today. We have a digger here cleaning up a really messy part of the farmyard and he is also demolishing the last of the old milking parlor. So I am just hooking on the muck rake to go and try to move the old parlor frame and dump it in our scrap metal pile. This will be the last evidence there ever was a milking parlor in that spot. And that milking parlor sat there now for 45 years. So it's the end of an era, but it's been lying out in the rain, half demolished for a long time. So it'll be good to see it gone. After we built the new milking parlor, the plan always was to build another slurry tank and another part of a cow house for like 50 more cows. And that is why it was never fully demolished, it was never concreted, it was sort of just left as a, it'll do, we'll be building a new shed at some point soon anyway. And I kind of came to the realization a few months ago that it's not gonna be done in the next couple of years. So I might as well spend a little bit of money tidy it up, get rid of the old parlor, and not only make it look better, but make it a more useful yard. This works. Oh my word, it's gonna work. Ha! Did not expect that to be so handy. I may have spoke too soon. You see me smashing a window now. It's very hard to see with the sun. It's hard to believe at one point in time, this was a state-of-the-art milking parlor and the pride and joy of this farm. And it is now, ah, it's about to fall. A tangled ball of mess that's heading for the scrap heap. I can't even imagine the point where the current milk compiler ends up like this. Just like tidying your house, tidying a farm is the same. You just move the mess all to one area and you say that it's tidier. Using the buck rake was definitely Smart decision. So I want to keep the plastic away from the metal. It's amazing how much crap builds up for no apparent reason over the course of like Two and a half years. It's not exactly the best time to be throwing away a few thousand pounds on restoning a yard and tidying places up, but it was just starting to annoy me too much that I just had to spend the money and I am a long way from someone who cares if something is tidy. Like it genuinely usually doesn't bother me, but it just got to the point where it was just too messy, too untidy looking. I was having to drive through mud and muck to feed the cows. There was a part of a feed barrier which was built in 2008, which still couldn't be used. So I was like, you know what? After 15 years, I think it's about time we use the feed barrier we installed. And I have a piece of metal stuck in my buck rake. Hmm. Hi on earth did that happen? Forgive me for the camera mount in the corner of the screen. Kirk would have 
check something else. Okay, that was easy. I think we can go back to the forks now. So this is a 12 foot MDE, uh, what's it called, a Triton buckrack? Great, great buckrack, I love it. Really well suited to this size JCB. The plan is to scrape down this whole yard as well and restone it. My Jimny looks so cute in behind the ENS. Shouldn't have used the word cute, no. My Jimny looks so awesome behind the ENS. This job has been tactically timed for when my dad is away on holidays because he would insist on keeping all of this crap because he thinks he would need it at some point in the near future. If there is one thing I am not, it is a hoarder. If I haven't used something in six months, I deem it worthy to be thrown out. And then I probably need it like a month after I throw it out and I regret it, but... My dad is a massive hoarder. He thinks he will need everything at some point in the future. If you send him to the dump, you can guarantee yourself he will check through everything you have given him to throw out and he'll bring about 10% of it back. It's amazing how much mess gathers up. You like throw something somewhere and then you forget about it for like three years. And it would be amazing to have concrete yards everywhere, but it makes no sense. I just cannot understand how people justify a concrete yard. It's amazing how much mess gathers up. You like throw something somewhere and then you forget about it for like three years. And it would be amazing to have concrete yards everywhere, but it makes no sense. I just cannot understand how people justify a concrete yard. Anyway, I shouldn't be needed for this job for a while now, so I'm going to go do something else. As I mentioned in a previous video, this is our scraping tractor. Yes, it's worse for wear. It actually got two new back rims because one of the rims collapsed. We couldn't fix the tire, so we replaced both the back rims. But why is it not on the scraper? Why is it still just sitting here? Let me show you. We think there is something wrong with the front axle bearings. And it's exactly the same on both sides. The bearings have totally collapsed, they really need replaced. We've probably already left it too late, but it is what it is. It is meant to go and get fixed, but we keep putting it off or saying we're too busy. We will send it off in the next few weeks, hopefully. We also have a problem with this tractor. It was sent away for an engine rebuild three or four years ago. It's never been right since it was done. It cost like 10,000 pounds back then to do it. It's gonna to have to go away again and get the engine looked at. It has like 40 horsepower, it's meant to have 120. 
it's leaking oil continuously it's not good the oil leak is hard to see but if you look really closely you might spot it machinery always causes problems that's just what happens with owning machinery so this is our replacement scraper tractor does the job really well and actually it's a really good thing to keep this running all winter because otherwise it gives problems but it also needs a little bit of care and definitely needs a new cab job on the list this morning is to get two sided samples one of our fourth cut and one of our fifth cut and see what sort of quality we are feeding at the minute so this is our fourth cut this is the good stuff um, 30 percent dry matter low 11s for me i think i could be pleasantly surprised we have had 12 me four before i just don't think this will be but it's hard to know so i'm going to take a sample i'm going to go in like a, a w shape try to get in past like in past the loose stuff so you wouldn't want to sample this you want to like poke a wee bit in because this might have been exposed to the air for a couple of days and then we'll go take a sample sorry then we'll go take a sample of the fifth cut so hard to get out I really want to buy a, a core and measure the density of my silages, but I don't have anything else to compare to and I haven't done it before I used the compactor, so how beneficial it would be, I'm not sure. Maybe not as dry as I thought. Right, I'll take one more from the very bottom. So now we want to squeeze as much air out as possible and seal the bag. So I seal it almost all the way and then really squeeze it. Okay. So that is our fourth cut. Now, we'll go get a sample of the fifth cut, but be warned, it's not pretty. It didn't fit in the silo, we had to just pile it up, we've only started feeding it, but since I'm sending samples off today, I'm going to sample the fifth cut anyway. But it is not pretty. That's a good enough view. So I'm not going to sample the whole face this time, because that bit over there was fed like three days ago and it's going off pretty fast because it's only been in for three weeks and a wee bit so i'm going to sample the bit that i grabbed out of today as it will be a better representation of what's in it i think oh it is wet oh my days so this is probably 16 17 percent dry matter like, I mean, it is wet. It's so tight. <laughs> I mean, it's not gonna be good silage, but we knew that when we were lifting it. Remember I said the most important thing is getting off the field? This has been fed to the beef and the heifers. And the reason we're feeding both at once is that we can get rid of this stuff and keep the good silage just for the dairy cows. <clears throat> I could see this coming back at like nearly 11 ME. But it's going to be very wet. Fifth cut. Fourth cut. I'll show you the progress before I go for lunch.
Okay, welcome back to like seven hours later. I meant to finish this video this afternoon, but farming life got in the way. I was just so busy, I had too much on. My dad's away on his holidays, so it's just me. Milking time is a hard deadline, which I cannot miss. So here we are at nine o'clock at night in the cow house. Every night we have to come out over winter and push in the silage to make sure the cows can reach it during the night. And we also have to check if there's any cows or heifers going to calve during the night. So I had to come over here anyway, and I figured this was as good a time as any to record what was meant to be the end of this video, which is a discussion about Red Tractor. And tomorrow morning, I will record the bit that was meant to be now, which is everything we've done today, what we got up to, and what the result of the digger being here for a full day looks like. So that's gonna come up at the end of the video. It's a little bit out of sequence. Something just dropped on my head. It's a little bit out of sequence, but that is the reality of farming. Things never go to plan. It's always sort of a mess, always a rush. So that's what you're getting. But anyway, back to Red Tractor. Today I made another TikTok about Red Tractor. I have made a lot of TikToks about Red Tractor now. They have got a lot of views. I think they've actually had an effect on farmers' moods and farmers' appetite for a battle, um, which is really what I wanted. And that is why I'm putting this bit in this YouTube video as well. It's really to try and make farmers angry about how they've been treated and about how wrong Red Tractor has got it. So I'm gonna give you a really quick summary of Red Tractor from its inception through to today. And we're gonna to touch on the new module called the Greener Farm Equipment, which has kicked up all of the, all of the anger and all of the problems for Red Tractor uh, in the last few weeks. So Red Tractor was founded in the year 2000 and it was founded by a group of the, Brit the farming unions, uh, some levy bodies like AHDB and I think at the very inception the British retailers were involved. I might be wrong on that. And the idea was to stop all these different inspection standards so that my farm, for example, might have to go through uh, audit for Tesco and audits for Sainsbury's, etc. So the idea was you have one inspection body, it's a one day a year event, and it covers you for everything that you can sell in the UK. Now that sounds like a really good idea, that is a really good idea. Something very similar is done in countless other countries around the world. For example, in Southern Ireland, they have Borobia inspections. That, it, it makes sense, okay? The initial idea was a good one. But what has happened in the last 20 something years since Red Tractor's inception was that it stopped focusing on farmers and stopped being a tool to add value to farmers' products. And it became controlled and influenced by the British retailers and the supermarkets. And I think a lot of the resentment which farmers feel towards Red Tractor is a result of Red Tractor stop, when stopped being about adding value and creating a brand for farmers' products and instead became a system whereby you have to do it or you're penalized and the brand is secondary to following the supermarket's rules. I feel like that's a pretty fair summary of the majority of farmers' opinions. Certainly, that is a summary of my opinions. Whenever I came home to farm, in 2014, my processor offered Red Tractor as a voluntary scheme. And if you done the audit, you got a bonus. So me in my naivety, um, and also Red Tractor was a lot simpler back then, uh, I signed up for the Red Tractor scheme and I was willing to do it for a bonus of 0.15 pence per litre, which is about 2,000 pounds a year. So I figured it was worth that money, but a lot of my fellow farmers within my co-op did not take up that offer. They did not deem it to be worth the £2,000 a year. And bear in mind when I say that, this was a scheme which was not even recognisable to the scheme we have today. 
In later, um, later years, it became a 0 0.4 pence per litre bonus. So that would have been a bonus equivalent to 4,000 pound. And again, there were some farmers didn't take it up. The majority at that point did take up the red tractor scheme within my co-op. And eventually it was made a condition to sell. So if you want to supply milk within the co-op, you have to have red tractor. And if you don't have red tractor, you get a significant penalty. This is probably five or six years ago this happened. So we moved from a bonus scheme, voluntary, if you want to do it, you'll be paid a premium to, you have to do this, it is compulsory, otherwise you'll be penalized. And then a few years ago, we had the real sting in the tail of Red Tractor, the real proof that they are not in any way out to support farmers. And that was their announcement that if my co-op deal farm wants to be Red Tractor assured and Red Tractor approved, they are not allowed to touch any milk which does not have red tractor approval. So what this means in effect is, if I lost my red tractor approval, my red tractor standards, Deal Farm will not lift my milk and I will have to dump my milk until I get it sorted. And there has been situations before within Northern Ireland where farmers have suffered huge financial loss because of the power of red tractor and for me, that was an absolute red line. There is no logical reason that Red Tractor would have done that move if it wasn't about total control and total power over the British agricultural industry. There is no argument that a policy like that is in the interest of farmers. It is entirely designed to take total control of the supply chain. And when they made that decision, that is when my attitude towards Red Tractor absolutely changed for life. So before we get on to the Greener Farm commitment and the recent news, I want to share a little bit of my recent experience as a farmer within the Red Tractor scheme. And this is really to give people a bit of context who maybe aren't farmers or are not from the UK, they don't have to go through Red Tractor. Just to give you an idea of why farmers are so angry and why farmers hate Red Tractor so much. So next week I have a NIEA inspection. So it's an environment agency inspection on my farm and that's by a regulator, that's by the government. That's a fairly high level of inspection. It's just a routine inspection. I haven't done anything wrong to be clear. Um, they do like 1% a year. I guess this year I am the unlucky 1%. But in my 12, 13 years of farming, I have always found NIEA, the Environment Agency, to be totally reasonable, decent, understanding people. And I know that is not a common view amongst farmers perhaps, but that has been my experience here in OMA. And if they ever come in conversation, I will say that, I will defend them and I will say, you know what? They're good, reasonable people to deal with, they're understanding, they're flexible. And my inspection is due on Thursday and I just happened to be away on holidays next week on Thursday and Friday. And I phoned NIEA up and they said, the guy will call you back tomorrow and you can chat to him about it, your inspector will call you back. And he called me uh, yesterday and he said, don't you worry about it, you go on ahead, that's no problem, no, we understand, like we can't expect people to be just there on the day that we set an inspection date. But what we'll do is, we will go and walk your farm, like walk all the fields. We'll go check all your drains, check you're not polluting anything <clears throat> on Thursday. And we can come back at a later date and check around the farmyard. And here's an email address. If you could just email us in your records and your paperwork, we can check that remotely. So it'll all be sorted for you. You don't need to worry. You can go on ahead on your holidays. And I was like, that is, such a good experience. I was like so nervous about getting a routine NIA Environment Agency inspection. And after I had that phone call, I was just like so much more at ease because I had forgotten that these people are not Red Tractor. <laughs> these people have a brain. HMRC is exactly the same. If you make a mistake on your VAT return or make a mistake on your tax or you need an extension on paying your tax bill, you can phone HMRC and they will help you 
they are like decent, considerate people. They will like not just try to catch you out. They understand you can get something wrong. Same with the Department of Agriculture. I had an issue with registering cows because their online system was down for basically two months. And I phoned them up and everyone I spoke to was so helpful. They were understanding. They were willing to like give me solutions to my problems and weren't just out to try to catch me and penalize me and make me feel like a little tiny insect. Now you contrast all of them experiences to a red tractor inspection experience. And the difference is day and night. Two and a half, three years ago, this is two inspections ago, my red tractor inspector asked me in casual conversation, have you had any C-sections recently? And because I'm not the kind of person who would ever lie, I try my best to never do that. I said, yeah, no, we had a C-section there like two or three months ago, actually. And we get very few C-sections. And then she said, so you've recorded that in your medicine book then? And I was like, oh, I've totally forgot about that C-section. And this is the honest truth. I swear this is the truth. It was 1 a.m. on a Sunday night. The vet came out to do the C-section. The vet administered the antibiotics. The vet supplied the antibiotics. The last thing on my mind was going up to the office to record that in my medicine book, and by the next morning, I had totally forgot. I made a mistake, that's fine. Any other agency would have been like, oh, we understand, that was a mistake, okay, that's okay. Red tractor, no. A major non-conformance because of that, which resulted in an unannounced inspection. So not only did I get a non-conformance for that issue, I then had to do my inspection all over again and they wouldn't give me any notice of when that was. So I basically was living in limbo land for six weeks, not knowing what was gonna happen. And it annoyed me so much. I was like, this is entrapment. You cannot ask a genuine question just to try to catch me out because that is what the inspector done. They tried to catch me out and they've done it countless times. And it just, it really bothers me that it's an attitude of trying to get the farmers to fail. And a retired inspector actually messaged me after one of my TikTok videos a few weeks ago. And he told, I was complaining on the TikTok video about how ridiculous it was that my milking parlor got two non-conformances for being dirty. And it's like the cleanest milking parlor in Northern Ireland. And I failed on two non-conformances for it being dirty. And I know that sounds like I'm super arrogant and I think I'm perfect, I don't. It's just that we cleaned it, even though it was already pretty clean. And by any standard, it is a clean milk and parlor, but they still find two non-conformances. And the retired inspector told me that inspectors will actively just find problems so that they reach a quota of non-conformances because if they don't, they're called into the office and they're questioned on why they're not getting an average number of non-conformances on farms. So even if you're doing everything perfectly, you will still have issues crop up because they're motivated to find issues. The whole thing, just, ugh, it just annoys me so much. I've ranted for so long. We have a, I'm in the Ulster Farmers Union Dairy Committee and uh, it's like a running joke that if you mention Red Tractor, you can say goodbye to the rest of the agenda for the evening because everyone just, rants and just gets so angry about Red Tractor. Hopefully I've conveyed some of that. Sorry for the rant, let's get back to the point of this, which is what's happened in the last few weeks. So basically, the British retailers, the BRC, they have a big say in Red Tractor in how it's run. And not a lot of farmers realize that, but basically they run the show. And the British retailers said to Red Tractor, we need carbon data, we need environmental data, biodiversity data, because we, the British retailers, want to be able to report on our scope three emissions, which is not a legal requirement, it's just something they want to do. We want to report on our scope three emissions, so we need farmers to hand over all of their data so we can do that. And why do they want to report on scope three emissions? It is entirely a vanity project, so they can then 
report on their ESG scores, which is economic social credit scores or something like that. It's total woke nonsense, in my opinion. And that is the reason why they pressed Red Tractor in to coming out with the Greener Farm commitment, to basically harvest farms' data for their non-legally binding desire to show how green they are and to show they were saving the planet. And they worked with Red Tractor on the Greener Farm commitment for the best part of a year and a half, two years, and at no point did they consult farmers. And then they released a statement about it. And it caught everyone a wee bit off guard. Farmers got angry, started asking questions, and the NFU then panicked. Because as far as I understand it, and this is fairly obvious from the NFU statements and how they've changed over the last few weeks, the NFU vice president, who sits at the director level on the Deal Farm board, he agreed to this, he agreed to the Greener Farm commitment, but he claims that he got the concession that it would go through increased scrutiny after they'd already approved it. He then came out a few weeks later after the backlash really started kicking off and saying that the NFU were not consulted. That is something which Red Tractor says is wrong. He, Red Tractor sticks in line with his original statement, which was that he was there at the direct level at the board meeting that approved this. So I'm going with Red Tractor's side of that story. Basically, things progressed. NFU committee level uh, passed a resolution for an internal, an independent review into Red Tractor. That got some traction. That was then what was picked up by the NFU leadership and they went along with it and agreed with it, called on that review from Red Tractor. And that in combination with my union, the Ulster Farmers Union, passing a unanimous vote of no confidence in the Red Tractor Executive Committee last week, forced Red Tractor's hand and they agreed to pause the Greener Farm commitment for a few months. So they agreed to pause it until the first of the two reviews proposed by the NFU is completed. But it really amounts to nothing because they agreed to pause it until essentially February, but the Greener Farm commitment wasn't meant to start until April. So it remains to be seen what comes of this. I am highly, highly skeptical there will be any meaningful change. I think everyone will just try to fudge it and try to convince farmers they've won something when in reality we have won nothing. And this has already started to happen. You can go and read the Red Tractor statements, go read the NFU statements. They're all talking about how farmers are angry about the procedure and not the principle. But the reality is farmers are angry at the principle of Red Tractor. It's the ever increasing standards, the continuously longer and longer inspections Nothing is ever removed. It's just more and more bureaucratic, more and more burdensome, more and more costly. It's just becoming totally impossible for farmers and every farmer dreads it, like dreads it to their core, which is not a good place for it to be with regards to farmers. So what do I think needs to happen? I think farmers need to accept nothing less than the Greener Farm Commitment going away. I understand that that is a very, very big ask and a much easier ask would be to have some things changed, some maybe more controversial parts softened, perhaps the Greener Farm Commitment delayed until the second NFU review. I understand that that is more achievable, but I think the correct approach for the farmers and for the farming unions would be just to say, no, we are not accepting the Greener Farm Commitment. If you want to bring something forward again, you can start from scratch and involve farmers and involve the farming unions, and we'll see what we come up with. But yeah, I think that's the best way forward. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there'll be a fudge. I think the farming unions will accept it because they are weak. At the end of the day, the farming unions own Red Tractor. They appoint the directors, like they have a lot of power and a lot of control and it just comes down to weak leadership that they don't exercise it. So 
I will continue doing my bit. I will continue trying to convince farmers to share their opinions and to use their voice as best I can. I think that is really what is important in all of this is that everyone shares their own story and their own opinions. Um, I was thinking of doing some sort of like a social media slogan or a merch slogan, something like maybe some hats that say red tractor abuses farmers, something like that. But I think it's a little bit too extreme. I don't think it will gain a lot of traction. So we'll maybe save that for if they do something that would really annoy farmers. <laughs> but hopefully that's not going to happen. Um, hopefully that's give you a good insight into what's happened to red tractor, how we've got here, what it's like as a farmer being involved in Red Tractor and a bit of the behind the scenes as to what goes on within Red Tractor. There's much more I could tell you, but if I tell you I'd get in trouble. It suffice to say that there's a few individuals who have caused a lot of this mess. And I know one of them individuals has publicly apologized, but she is uh, being replaced in February anyway. So I think she's kind of like a scapegoat for everyone. It baffles me that the CEO can stay in post after all of this. I mean, if you lose the confidence of the people who own you as a company, and you lose the confidence of the people you're meant to serve, the farmers, how you can remain a CEO blows my mind, but it's the reality of the world we live in. People can weasel their way out of a lot of things. So we will wait and see what happens. I apologize for that very lengthy update. I did not prepare any thoughts. I did not prepare any notes. I'm certain that comes across as clear, um, but yeah, my week's been mad, so I hope you forgive me. I will catch up with you in the morning where I'm gonna take you through what we done yesterday, and I'm gonna finish this video off with the next two projects on the planned to-do list on this farm. For now, good night. So this used to be our old milking parlor and up until yesterday the frame of the old milking parlor was still there and this was like a pile of mess left from when we built the new milking parlor over here. And the reason it was left as a pile of mess was because we always intend and we will eventually build a shed to go from here over to these steels over here. So they are technically all in line so the plan is roof this put in a slurry tank here and put in another 40 or 50 cubicles for cows that would leave us with one long continuous feed passage from the very front of that cow house to the very back of that cow house so it's going to happen eventually but whenever we finish the milking parlor i thought i'll do that in a few years we should have taken a before video to then show you the after but I wasn't that organized yesterday. It was just one of them days. Too much was going on. But anyway, this is the result of our day's work yesterday. So that's gonna be the end of today's video or this week's video. It's kind of been a bit of a messy week and that definitely is gonna be reflected in this video, but that's just the reality of farming, I suppose. We also restoned this area. Again, best intentions were to concrete out and concrete the whole yard, hence why the gully was left there, but uh, it never happened. I'm not spending that much money on concrete. Yes, that is my Jimny, and yes, it is incredible. Anyway, if you liked that video, drop me a like. If you want some questions answered, leave me comments. And if you really enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button. I very much appreciate everyone who's watching these videos, and I will see you next week.